way. You know, Michael Jordan said that, you know, he was one of his best teammates. And obviously within the episodes, I just thought he was perceived as a, as a guy who was the number two behind Michael Jordan and, you know, was, was, was a great teammate. Uh, Jordan, Jordan was awesome, man. Jordan, uh, buddy, he's the best. <laughs> his, his mentality and his, uh, his drive, his focus, he just, he just, he, he had the winning mentality, I guess, you know what I mean? And, uh, yeah, there's more, you'll see more to it on, um, has everyone seen the, um, the documentary, The Last Dance? Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's good. Yeah, it's I'm, good. Eh? I'm five episodes in, not quite watched it all yet. Same That's with me, well. five same, as well. Same. Same with Lewis. Yeah, he's five episodes in. Okay. Very good. Yeah, it's a it's a really good, uh, really good documentary. Um, growing up with Jordan being my uh, one of my idols in basketball for sure. Uh, I was in in the Olympics when they had the dream team. I was in Greece at that time. And uh, when they were playing in the Olympics, I was going for U.S. And it was funny because all my family was like, uh, well, my cousin. My cousin was a big big time basketball fan. Uh, he actually played in Greece too, and. Uh, he would. He had everything Jordan, uh, Jordan shoes, Jordan sh jersey, Jordan headbands, armbands. I'm like, wow. So to actually see them, uh, to see the Olympics there, and then uh, see how dominating they were, it was it was awesome, man. It was really really good to see. So uh, one of our one of our guests for today is uh, Julian. What's going on, my man? Not much. How you guys doing? Awesome, awesome. Uh, Julian, you, you'll get to introduce yourself uh, uh, for, for us. Currently works with uh, Athletes Institute as well, and he's uh, the strength and conditioning coach. Um, awesome, man. Great, great vibes. Super energetic. And uh, definitely, uh, I'm, I'm happy that you're here. Uh, what we've been doing, Julian, usually weekly, we have soccer talks with um, various different coaches. So far, it's, uh, it's been Neil, Lewis, um, and, and Chris. And we just basically just touch up on different subjects. You know what I mean? It's not, it's not script-driven um, <laughs> podcast here. You know what I mean? We just, we just have some fun, talk, and uh, see what everyone's thoughts and beliefs are. So if you want to go ahead, Julian, just introduce yourself to, to the people here, and we'll go from there. Sure. Sorry, if I, if I'm still sweating. I just finished a, a, a live workout on Instagram, and I remembered 11 o'clock. Supposed to speak with you guys, but uh, no, thanks, Christos. Um, I just so a little bit about me. I just moved back from uh, San Antonio last uh, September. Um, I was over there for the last nine years, coaching both club and college soccer. Um, long story short visa issues, I uh, had to move back home to Canada, um, and I happened to um, be able to get on the staff at AIFC, which is where I met Christos, um, and to be honest, um, having been away for so long, I grew up playing uh, soccer in, in, in the youth leagues here in Canada, um, but being away so long, I didn't really know too much about, you know, the youth landscape in, uh, in Canada, but coming back and, and joining AI um, and meeting Christos and the other staff, Manny Corona, Ainsley, Amrick, um, has been a real eye-opener in terms of talent and I think the level that AI is trying to bring, um, AI is trying to create anyway, um, out there in Orangeville. So excited to be here. I know that was pretty short. Um, but I'm trying to get my heart rate down. So like I said, I'm so sweating. So get slowly gathering my thoughts here. Well, awesome. Um, so we can talk, like I said, there's a lot of topics we can always talk about. Um, one other thing I wanted to touch base is start off is in terms of strength and conditioning, do you guys, uh, so even from Lewis or Allison's uh, where you're at, um, do you think it should be mandatory? I know for us in here in Canada, we have a house league and stuff like that. Um, what age would you guys recommend or say your, in your, in your professional opinion, when would be a good time to start strength and conditioning? I'm not talking about weights, weightlifting, just your own body weight and stuff like that. So uh, I'll open that up to uh, anyone and uh, we can go from there. Um, I mean, I would probably suggest between the ages of like 14 and 16. Um, just my experience with the Barcelona Academy, like, um, and uh, the kids at La Masia, like they don't start doing any weights until they're at least 16. Everything they do is more resistance bands, um, stability training, that kind of stuff. Um, 
because the, you know, there's the theories that it'll stunt your growth and um, I'm not a doctor. I don't pretend to be. So just from my experience, the environment I've seen um, these, you know, um, youth semi-professional athletes, they're more into to that kind of stuff, more stability. And um, they, they, everything they do is more or less on field. They would have one training in the morning, which would be your conditioning, um, you know, different types of running, whether it was, you know, running in like a water bath or um, being hooked up for um, to test your lungs. Um, they do these things like, you know, three, four times a week. And then plus they're on field, whether it's a technical session, um, like coordination, and then they would be on field for their team practice and a functional. I, I agree. I think you, it's got to be sort of between 14 and 16. I think anything below that, sort of any physical work's got to be uh, SAQ, agility, uh, coordination-based work. Um, I think, again, go back to parents. I think parents are, often get ahead of the game, don't they, when, when their child's small and think, oh, he's got to be doing these weights and he's got to be doing this and that. When it's not true, they've just got to let the body develop as naturally as possible. Um, and between the ages of, well, I, I would even go a little bit further, maybe 15, start about 15 to 16 in, in, in doing that more strength-based work um, and building on that as, as they go through their later teen years, really. I think uh, there is that early misconception of you've got to get stronger, but you just got to wait. Whichever player it is, they've got to wait and be patient with that player. Uh, yeah, I, I agree with um, both of what you guys said. I, coming from uh, over in America, it's a um, very competitive culture. Um, and I had a lot of parents ask the same question. And I've seen a lot of parents go the other route where they're, you know, they're paying for people to throw weight on their children, um, which is kind of, it's their call. I think there's a lot of people who will say it's wrong. Um, it could definitely do damage if done in the wrong way. <clears throat> um, but in my personal opinion, I think the biggest thing kids need to focus on is like what you guys said is the coordination piece, you know, and a, a lot of coaches get mad at kids in game because their first touch is poor, they're tripping over their own feet, you know, it's because they don't know how to move well. So, you know, spending the time on stuff like you say, you know, the SAQ and the coordination and, you know, if you want to get a bit more intense, add them with some more intensity, get the bands out, stuff like that, it, it will challenge them just enough to where they will improve and, and have, you know, gains in strength without, you know, making them susceptible to getting hurt with, um, you know, ridiculous amounts of weight, which, again, in my opinion, I don't think they need at such young ages. I think you, what you said is spot on, you know, 14 to 16, that range is probably the best time to start introducing stuff like that. It's selling that as well, isn't it, to, to the younger age groups? So it's not a, oh, well, listen, we're working on this. You, you do it so it's in like a game format, so it's fun but they are working on their agility, their coordination, their, their eye-hand coordination, their yeah. eye-foot coordination, all that sort of stuff. But it's fun. It's games. It's, it's, it's enjoyable. But, but yeah. you know what they're working on, but they don't so much, which is, I think, half the battle as well, I think. I have a quick question for you, Julian. Um, in your opinion, um, do you think that um, when teams are training in the in the gym they should be doing general things or individual things because when i said in my opinion between the ages of 14 and 16 um it's because sometimes you're going to get a really big 14 year old and sometimes you're going to get a really small 16 year old like development wise in their body do you think for coaches that they should take that into consideration and hold off on training or add training with weights, depending on the development of the player, depending on their age? Uh, that's a tough one. Uh, so I could speak on my experience at AI. Um, I currently, I'm the only strength trainer there. You know, hopefully when we grow, which is the plan, we'll be able to bring more people on staff. But, you know, when you're, when I work with a group of about 16, so as much as I'd like to, to personalize a workout to like individual players, sometimes it's tough. Um, mm -hmm. Obviously, if, if you have the bandwidth, you can give that 14-year-old who's a bit taller more of what he needs versus that, you know, 14-year-old who still hasn't hit, you know, his, his peak in terms of growing. Um, but it's, it's, it takes a, I guess a little bit of creativity as a coach to kind of just find that middle ground in between what, you know, 
each of them needs. So it's a challenge. Um, but I think, especially with the early ages, if you, if you stay away from the heavy weights, it makes it even easier, right? Because yeah. then you're not having to mess around and kind of tweak it here and there, which takes away time from the overall workout. And then it just gets kind of messy. So. Okay. Yeah. And how many teams do you work with at the moment? Like, is it one of those schedules where it's like you see multiple teams kind of back to back? Yeah. So currently uh, the way we were going um, before everything shut down, we had the, the boys would train Monday, Wednesday with me, uh, or sorry, Monday uh, in the weight room. Um, and we would go, I'd have back to back to back. So I'd start with the, our youngest group, our U14s, U17s, the U, U21s in our last slot. And then Crystals, correct me if I'm wrong, I believe Wednesday I had the girls um, and then they would come in with me and then they'd go and do film with Crystals. So we had one, one session a week. Um, with each team, which a lot of them, they're new to, to weight training as well. So we thought that was kind of a good, a good starting point just to introduce them to a lot of stuff and not overwhelm them. Um, but yeah, that's, that's how the format went while I was working with them. Cause I, I was the um, fitness and conditioning coach at uh, the Falcons for two years. Okay. And I found it frustrating because uh, the way it worked was like each team had one hour in the training with me and everything would be so back to back that you don't really get that like minute to refresh, remind yourself who you're training and then adjust and be mm -hmm. like fresh. I felt that there was a lot of work I had to do outside of work to prepare myself before the teams arrived. I was just wondering yeah. if you had any tips or things that you've, been able to to think of to do when when that kind of happens yeah it, it's tough um I mean because you know as, as a coach especially as a strength coach hopefully you're working with a staff who kind of respects your craft and, and kind of gives you the time you need I know as a strength coach it, it can be hard sometimes because a lot of head coaches simply want to see balls at feet or you know kids on the ball which is very good it's, it's not wrong um, but at the same time, you know, when you when you do have a strength coach on staff, you know, giving them the time they need to kind of um, implement, you know, the vision that they have for the kids as well. So for me, I think I was in the same boat as you. Like it was, it's hard kind of squeezing it in within an hour, right? Mm -hmm. Because the 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 way you talk and the mindset you have with a U14 year old is going to be very different to a U17. Like that's three years, yeah. you know, a jump. Um, not only for me to prepare myself, but the exercises as well. So for me personally, um, it was just kind of uh, learning from each session that I did. Um, one of the things that I, I, I did, I would have them obviously warm up on their own. Um, so that way when they're coming in, it's just kind of flowing. And from the, from the get go, when I started working out with the boys, um, I, we have a very big whiteboard in our weight room. And what I would do is I have the workout on the board already. So when my U14s come in, they see it and we get to work. And as the U17s kind of shuffle in and they're getting changed, they'd walk in, see the board. So they kind of already can visualize what's happening. And then that way they go out, they do their warm up, and it just kind of, it shaves off about, you know, three to four minutes on what I got to do in the beginning as far as like explaining what they're going to do. So that was a, a very big help to me. And then like just as they kept doing that, it was just like, it was clockwork. Yeah. You know, warm up, they come in, they see the board, we just get straight to it, maybe a little adjustment as far as, you know, what I saw the first group doing wrong, um, I can correct the second group, and then I just kept kind of rolling from there. Okay. Yeah. Um, actually, I have another question about uh, warming up, in your opinion, because, um, I mean, I grew up with all my team having like a generic warm up, where, you know, you go and do the exact same thing as everyone else before a game. <laughs> Um, and during quarantine, I decided to get certified in like, um, kind of like a yoga meditation, um, certificate certification. And one of the things they talked about was, uh, creating like, um, sequences when you're doing your routines, mm -hmm. um, for like fitness. And I find that, um, when I do three exercises and continuously repeat the same ones, that I have a way better range of motion. And I find that that's something we don't do when we warm up is we just kind of like, you know, you do your laps, your 
whatever it is, but then it's like, you only do it like that one or two times and then you go into the next exercise. Mm -hmm. But your body kind of needs to have, do multiple exercises and then do it again to like get a better result. That's what I'm finding this quarantine is um, I'm having better results with opening up like my hips because I've always had really tight hip flexors and glutes and doing these things that I, I'm just learning about now in a certain sequence I'm finding I, I can move way better mm -hmm. and I don't know if that's something you've heard of or apply or or if you'd suggest no I, I think that's cool I think the more obviously the more stuff you could add to the warm-up the better uh for me personally like going back to just kind of the, the time slot that we have um I the boys we have a I don't want to say generic but we have a warm-up that we're used to whether it's you know pre-game or or prior to practice or before weights that they go through and you already know there's going to be some kids who put more into the warm-up than others so they'll have their 10 minutes by themselves and before every workout normally I get them in and we do some either mobility stuff or you know I could tell maybe if, if the warm-up was good I see beads of sweat we'll hop right into like some sort of fun reaction type thing um, but you know what you said about the mobility stuff I think that's, that's very good um, and you could, that's something that I like to assign for homework because I could tell there's some kids who move, who suffer, they, don't, they don't move as well. Right. But if you were to assign them, you know, some sort of mobility work over two weeks, when you come in and say, you throw that exercise in there, you could already tell if they've been doing their homework and if they've been improving. So yeah, yeah. I think that's, that's good. Yeah. That's very good. And also for the warm up, um, do you do like the heart rate stuff? Like, usually it's you have to get your heart rate to like what 120 do you yeah. find yeah they do they focus well, on that or no just kind of we yeah so we again we don't have the the tools as of yet uh we actually just got player maker it doesn't track we may have heart monitors i'm not too sure but it, that's a bit difficult again that comes down to kind of how much staff you have so me personally i'm not gonna i'm not gonna track individual heart rates i think just basically you could tell all right, you got a sweat on, your heart rate's going to be up if you got a sweat on, right? So just judging by that for me. Cool. Yeah, thanks. Hey, um, Lewis, I was going to ask you a question regarding um, your, your girls' team, your women's team. Um, how do they do in terms of uh, um, so strength and conditioning? Is there a coach assigned for that as well? Uh, and what, what protocols or process do they go through? You know what I mean? Because we're talking uh, – here we're talking between U14 to U18, say, and say from your age group and, and, and on. Now you have some, some ladies on your team that are a lot older, a lot younger, right? So a lot of different, uh, different band there. So how do you guys do it? I think, I think for us personally, because of the, the position that we're in, because of the league that we're in, which is tier two within the Welsh, the Welsh uh, system, you know, it's really difficult to find you know, even a goalkeeper coach and a physio. So we do have a goalkeeper coach. We've got an assistant coach, a manager. I'm the head of training. We also have a physio. So what we what we tend to do is tend to let the physio do a lot of the pre-match stuff. They would tend to do the, the warm-ups and the stretching themselves. So we just let them take that because for us personally, it's not sort of, it's not our jurisdiction. We don't really have a, a great understanding in, in that area. Our physio has a master's uh, in, I think, is some, something to do with medicine on that side of and that side of physiotherapy. So we just say, hey, you know, you do that. You focus on that. You know, we don't want to tread on your toes. But I think, I think for me and, and for everyone on the team and the staffing team. I think it's important for us to understand a little bit more into the aspects of S and C and and what goes on for us in training. You know, we just focus on you know kind of the basic stuff, just sort of the you know agility, balance, coordination, that kind of stuff. Really, for us, we try to incorporate that as much as we can. But I think you know at the ages they are, which is like eighteen to thirty-five, you know they they've done a lot of that within the maturity years. You know, sort of twelve to fourteen. 15, 16. So, um, you know, all we try and do is just try and just, you know, sort of tweak them a little bit just to get them a little bit better. I think the key with anything, Lewis, isn't it? It's, um, it's that multidisciplinary blend that coaches have that with their sports scientists and sports scientists have the knowledge of the coaching side and 
they don't have to have extensive knowledge, but as long as everyone knows what each of them wants and what they want from the players, then they're all on the same page. So they have to link in with each other really, really well. Now we have this within the academy that we want more communication all the time now. We want to hear what, what uh, players need in terms of football, what they need in terms of physicality, what they mean in term, need in terms of psychology that makes that player all rounded. But again, you can't get that if one person's doing one thing, one person's doing another, one person's doing another. So they all have to be interlinked. So it's important that sports science, strength and conditioning um, and football are well intertwined both ways, I think. So I think there has to be a bit of knowledge going going all the way around so everyone knows what each other's are doing. Otherwise, you get fragmented all over the place and you don't get the results that, that you're wanting, I think. I think that I've, on, in, in my experience, I found that a lot of coaches don't tend to have that all-rounded sort of that all-rounded view i've experienced a lot of coaches who've got you know sort of a one dimension they don't sort of see that view of s and c or they see that view of analysis and you get the analyst coming in and going this is what i've got for you and they sort of go in i don't really need that you know i'm fine with my own vision and my what i can see on my on my own i don't need you know you and your cameras and your that you know your software so, um, you know, there's almost an arrogance in the Lewis. There's almost an arrogance for some coaches to say, listen, I, I know better than you. You're, you're an analyst or, or you're a strength and conditioning coach. Whereas they don't realise that you've, you've got to work with everyone to make the players better. Now, they'll aid in you as a coach to make everyone better. It's not just about you. And I think a lot of coaches, certainly in England anyway, yeah. <laughs> we get that, don't we, I think. You know, I think people need to understand that as a coach, you know, I've spent five years studying a degree and a master's in it. Now I'm no S&C coach. So if somebody could come in and go, you know, this is what we need to do to make our players better in this area. Oh, fantastic. You know, it sort of puts a weight off my shoulders because I don't need to have to think about that too much. I can focus on myself whilst getting all the other aspects of S&C and analysis and all that. So, yeah, I think it's a major benefit. Yeah, because you've got to get to a stage where if you have got the relationship with your sports scientist or your strength and conditioning coaches, say, listen, this is what I want from this individual. This is what I want from my team. And you've got to trust them to not just deliver it and make them better, but to work with you within the confines of your curriculum and your coaching syllabus to make it make a success. And if uh, again, if, if you're all not on the same page, as I said before, you, you're swimming upstream, basically. But um, yeah, yeah, it's key. I think, as as you say, it's certainly over here. It's um, there's a lot of old school coaches, shall we say, that don't like to work within sort of sports science and, and things like that. So it has to be worked together. And the more you work together within each department, the better the end product becomes. Yep, I agree with that, hundred percent. You know, same page. I think it comes down to the kind of conversations you have uh, right off the get go. Um, cause it's not about just hiring a SNC coach and, you know, it looks good to the parents and he's doing this and he's doing that, but then you kind of, cause I've seen it to where, you know, coaches have been hired and it's good for maybe the first couple of weeks. And then, all right, coach starts cutting it 10 minutes short, 15 minutes short, 20 minutes short. And now there's a disconnect between, you know, the SNC coach and the head coach because it wasn't established what you wanted to see out of the players from the get go. Right. So like you guys said, getting on the same page and saying, you know, this player needs this or as a whole, you know, this is what we want. And then being able to see that, because I think uh, what SNC coaches can give and analytics and all that is kind of an objective measure outside of, um, you know, you're not a good player. Well, he can be a good player. We just need to get him a bit stronger or we need to work on his mobility so he can move better, stuff like that, you know. So it gives that 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 level, like I said, of objectivity to where you know you can't argue it because it's it's on paper, it's facts. That's it. Those facts they're easy to they're easy to judge, they're easy to sort out, and they're easy to benchmark from point A to point B. Whereas, mm -hmm. as you say, probably football ability and technical ability and, and what you can do within a game is a little bit more more difficult to judge. But from a strength and conditioning point of view, you can go listen. I've got this player from here. And I've yeah. got there, um, and there's there's my results. But I think yeah. on on the flip side of that, I think there's got to be that relationship so that you can the coach can also say, listen, I'm not happy with this. Mm -hmm. I, I want it done in a different way, and 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 that dialogue is all about communication at the end of the day in yeah. in every situation. So um, to get the best results, and you're all working for the, for the same end goal, aren't you? So it, it, working together makes yeah. makes a lot of sense. 
I think that's the key thing there, right? Is working together. And I think people forget that. So um, from my experience with coaching and, and, and coaching with uh, uh, athletes and, and, and coaching with different coaches, people don't get that idea sometimes. Is working together, working as a unit, working as a team, being receptive to one another. I think it's key. And when, uh, when your players see that um, and, and the club or the academy that you're, you're working for sees that, then you're going to get results. You know what I mean? You're going to get that success because everybody's on that same page. But if uh, you start undermining people and um, not validating their qualifications and stuff like that in terms of what they can do, then you're, you're, you're cutting them short, right? And, and I've seen that. I've seen that many times. Um, someone comes in and is like, no, 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 uh, we're going to do it this way. Or, no, we don't need strength and conditioning. We need to do this. And, and I know better, right? So you're already, you're already lost, <laughs> No matter, I'm not just talking about wins. Uh, I'm talking about from any kind of development, strength and conditioning, uh, developing the athlete um, in, in soccer as a person, the mental state, so many things. Right off the bat, it's been negative, and that's what I believe people have to do going forward, have to be receptive, you know what I mean? Tell people straight up, you know what I mean, how it is. This, we need to work together. I can't do it all by myself. I can't do it. So you know I, have I, mean? a, I have a quick yeah, question regarding still, that. Yeah. Sorry, Sorry. Alex. I was just going to go with um, wondering because how important in your opinions is um, like the top of like a club, like, you know, whether it's a director or a president to kind of organize each team and have like, you know, a specific training program for age, per gender. Um, how important do you guys think that that is? Because I was working at Oakville Soccer Club and I had a big, a big problem because I was the director of the 10 program and the girls that I was coaching did not know anything about the game. And when I was working with the Barcelona Academy, you know, you were teaching six year olds how to create safety passes with in depth and if six year olds can do it. Why are my U10s not understanding this? And I felt that a lot of the times the coaches would just coach whatever they wanted. There was no, like unity within the club. And I found that's a big problem in Ontario, at least from the club that I was coaching at was there was no curriculum. It's like, okay, you're a qualified coach. That's your team. You can decide who you're coaching, how you're going to coach it, whatever formation you want to coach. But then when your team moves on to the next coach, they're almost like behind because everyone has their own idea. Like, so what, what do you guys think? How can we kind of make that environment better? Does anyone have any comments here? Uh, I think it's communication again. I think you, you, all, all your coaches have to be on the same page. So we, as a professional academy, have been going, what, this will be going into our fourth season. So it's been a case of, we know a lot about coaching. We know a lot about what other people are doing, but it's about getting that end, end product for us. So with me as full-time with the 18s, players coming into me from... Nine to sixteens should know exactly how we play, and it's how we get that on board. And as you say, it can be difficult because, in one respect, you've got to have your coaches having their individual style of coaching, and you've got to let them develop and, and let them do their own stuff and do their own thing. But it's got to be within the confines of of your structure and how you want to play. So, for me, it, it goes down to positions. So what a, a, a right fullback should look like should be the same all the way through. Now, like a player profile, more or less. It, yeah, absolutely. But a, but a foundation player might not look like a youth development player. So uh, a nine-year-old will not automatically look like that 18-year-old product come the end. So it's how he develops along that pathway, but will ultimately become that type of player. And it's difficult, but I think it has to be put in your structure um, so that they can, and they, they're aware. They, they need to be aware of what, what their capabilities are and what their capabilities should be to succeed and become. Again, I'm, I'm coming from a sort of academy professional development uh, side of it where it's important for the, for the boys at the end of it to, uh, to succeed. Whereas sometimes it's a little bit different in grassroots where enjoyment's the key. So I don't know, is, it, is grassroots, is it, import, is it more important for... Each team to have different development patterns. I don't know. I don't know. That's the difficult difference, I would say, for, um, for, for, for grassroots and, and sort of professional stuff. Certainly from my professional academy environment, it has to, be, it has to align all the way through. Uh, yeah. Otherwise, it, I, it won't work. 
I definitely agree with that, uh, especially from uh, if you're looking at a grassroots program. Um, yes, you got to make it fun and, and, and um, entertaining to the players and, and, and let them enjoy it. Have fun is the key thing, you know what I mean? And but building them from the grassroots in terms of baby steps, but having the same methodology start from the smaller age group all the way working up to your competitive teams, you know what I mean? So it's very crucial, I believe, working from a grassroots it's because they're going to be your they're going to be your building blocks, your foundation to what your competitive teams are going to be in the future. So, um, having that mentality in terms of coaches do whatever they want and say, okay, you're going to coach a U8 team or you're going to coach a U9 team, and that's it. You go off, do your own little thing, and stuff like that. Then, I believe two things: one, either the club or academy has failed because they've just basically given them a responsibility in terms of soccer and, and saying, okay, you know what to do, off you go. And we'll touch base with you throughout the season, and then we'll reevaluate at the end of the year. So what you need to do is you have to have, a, as a club and academy, I believe, is you have to follow it. You know what I mean? And, and it's not it's not that you're just being a boss. You have to set in your values. Um, like have, have a methodology. To, yeah, yeah. You know, like when my when my daughter when my daughter was uh, she went to the Marsa Marsa Academy. Um, I thought, I thought, honestly, um, it's sad to hear that they're not here anymore, but I think that, um, the technical director at that time and the values and stuff like that, that he implemented across was amazing. Like you can, yeah, I can see a really good job. Yeah. Zavi was, Zavi was his name, right? Yeah. yeah. yeah he, he was awesome, man. Like I was sitting back and you could feel the values. You could feel the importance. Every kid that walked onto that pitch felt like Messi or felt like PK and felt, even even the system and the way they did it was amazing that's that's quality there right that's what you got to do you got to make these kids feel good but every coach there was developing the same yeah there's some kids that are going to struggle and they're going to need to develop and you have to be patient in order to do that but it all starts from the grassroots level otherwise if you don't if you don't catch it on the grassroots level don't forget about 13 14 forget about it the kid if the kid doesn't have the methodology or the value from the beginning by the time they come into your program 13 or 14, and a good example, Allison, you were saying when you were like uh, some of the kids, they, they can't even play soccer. They can't even they can't even do it. They don't know. They're just put in there because unfortunately in Canada and in Ontario, I'll speak for Ontario, a, a lot of times it's just a secondary or third sport. It's not the primary sport. So little Johnny and little Maria are going to go play hockey. And, oh, summertime, no hockey, throw them into soccer. But as a club and academy, you have to build those values. You have to make kids and people feel important in, in terms of why they here. Why do you want to learn how to play soccer? You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I'm here to show you that. I'm here and, and our staff and our coaches, we're all here together. So you hear it from me, it's one way. You hear it from another way, it's the same way. It goes down, it, it, it's the same thing. And that should be recognizable to other people as well, shouldn't it? So, for example, yeah. uh, if, if there's a team turning up um, to play a tournament, Every other team should know exactly what to expect from that team. Exactly. They're going to be respectful. They're going to be uh, they're going to be high tempo. They're going to warm up really well. Um, we're going to have a tough game on our hands. They're going to be recognisable. Same with the individual. If you've done it really, really well, and those values and the methodology and the process is all put in place, then the player and the team should be recognisable to everyone else. Hopefully, in a formidable way. Uh, mm -hmm. They listen. This is this is these are, these are be reckoned with as as, a, as an outfit. But with those values integrated, I think to be able to to be able to actually take a look at it and put it in place, one of the big things that's missing is the, is the measurables. So you really want to move forward. What does forward look like? And and for most clubs, they have no idea. Um, like I'll take red the Red Bulls as an example. The New York Red Bulls have a they have a set of guidelines. So at age ten, you can strike the ball this quickly. You can dribble this fast through cones. You can dribble this fast backwards. You can you can shoot this accurately and it keeps from distances and you keeps going up as the age groups go. And I mean, I've seen Julian working with the AI girls with uh, the beat test and there's a measurable right there. And I think if you have measurables and you set the measurables, now you have targets that they can use and you can start at a grassroots and it's as simple as how quickly can you run a 50 meter? How, how, um, you know, we do a little bit with, with keep ups and stuff, but I think even from the coordination, the ABCs, you need to have measurables and, and that's what's missing is we haven't we in most of the time especially at the club levels we don't benchmark and i think it starts where if you set a set of benchmarks for your u9s your u10s your u11s and 12s in the in this area 
then you can you now have something to measure against. And if you're if you're below the benchmark, then you have something that you can say, okay, now I can build a program to try and help me get to that benchmark. And now I have measurables that I can look at every two months, every four months to see if I'm progressing or if, or if I'm regressing or, but if you don't know where you are right now, which I would say 90% of the groups don't, then you don't really know where to go. And you're just kind of subjectively moving around the different, you see something this week that looks good and you, you throw it in. But if you have a, that, those benchmarks help you plan. And I think that's where most clubs are missing it is we don't benchmark. Mm -hmm. I, yeah. I really agree with you, Chris, on that. Um, I think in every training, you can really have measurables. Um, one of the ways, like, I, I feel like I was able to measure my, my players, like, on the psychology part of the, the game, was constant feedback. Um, I let them, you know, talk to themselves, talk to me, give me their opinions of the training session. You know, we're talking about what we learned. Um, and then there's always that, you know, during my training sessions, I always have a little pad with me to, whether it's my iPad or whether it's like a notepad, I just scribble things down, what's working, what's not working, um, to measure their progression. Um, I usually, um, when I'm doing my table of the, the year, I usually do every three months, I have all my training sessions planned out for three months and then when I go into to each week, I can see if I need to adjust the next month's training based on their um, either their feedback or their their performance level. And like that's something that's helped me, but that's something that I don't know a lot of coaches that do. I just do it because I have a lot of time and I can do that. But um, if you're you know a new coach and you're not you know given the right tools or equipment or pathway or guidance or mentorship it's really difficult i think for for anyone to be really successful in a club unless you're just a, like a standout coach you know yeah i've got a question for you neil um in regards to obviously you spoke about your curriculum and you spoke about your values and your philosophies what other aspects of the of the sort of the sphere would you say impacts upon your curriculum that you deliver is that for me uh, for Neil, sorry, Alison. I think um, there's all sorts, to be honest. So the, the things that can impact on your curriculum is, um, from our point of view, games are massive. Um, we're trying to implement uh, more of a, a free games program now so that the, the, the players are playing more games and doing less training. So that's one thing we're trying to try and implement for next season. Feel that they, I think I mentioned it last week, players learn more within the game. So if you're playing um, a game Wednesday and a game Sunday with one training session or two training sessions in between, more learning is taking place rather than just training, training, training. Because uh, the training session should look like the game anyway. So our curriculum is very much based on um, anything being sort of game related. Obviously, the older they are, the more game related it can be. But Again, you can't get more game related than a game itself. So I think curriculum will always be changed. I think it'll I think it'll be very, very similar for the for the younger ones. Certainly coming into sixteens to eighteens when performance is, is more important, it can be affected more the curriculum and what we're working on by results and by uh, player performance and by uh, player standards and if they get dropping or if they're getting better. That's the biggest influence I could find. But certainly going through the nice 16s, I think it'll only be affected by games. So games will people play every, every, every very often, if, if possible, so the, sort of the coming season, which I think is a big thing for us next season. At the obviously at the PDP phase, which is which is what you're at, how would you teach them within that curriculum? Would you go for more of a spire curriculum, or would you sort of teach them within a blocked or an opposition based? teaching method way how would you normally do it we go we go six week blocks um we do uh two weeks attacking two weeks defending and then two weeks sort of uh more small sided game based stuff so um i use the, the last two weeks as more of a consolidation of, of what we've been working on but they're all they're all very generic they're all basic defensive principles basic attacking principles so that if you put that out as a, as, a, as a skeleton of your curriculum, you can then work based around the game. So if they've played a game on a Saturday and they've struggled with a, um, with a quality of, of, of their, 
the unit, so the defensive unit, for example, um, then your basic defensive principles will work on that during your defensive week and you will, you will work on those, whatever it may be, whether it be that you're dropping off too deep, you're not getting tight enough as individuals, you're not narrowing off on the balls on the opposite side. You can, you can work within that quite loosely. So it is a, there's a skeleton sort of um, curriculum there at 18s. Yeah. But to work around it, we try and make it more so that it's uh, more related to the professional game, which they'll be going into hopefully come so come eighteen, which is less structured and topic and, and, and phase based. So it kind of has to be that sort of transition from sixteens to eighteens to, to the pro game, which is which is kind of quite difficult. Isn't it? What does your um, what does your physical model look like? Do you, um, do you agree in sort of so you, you play obviously on a on a Saturday within the uh, is it the Youth Alliance League? I'm not sure. Yeah. yeah. So, um, would you take a rest on a Sunday and then do a recovery day on a Monday? Uh, we do rest day on Sunday. Um, I don't know whether Julian, Julian will agree with me on this one, but we, we're not a big advocate for two-day recovery. Um, mm -hmm. The only evidence based on that is strength-based. Um, mm -hmm. So what we do is we have the rest day on the Sunday and we train. We don't train massively on, on a Monday, but we consider it a, a normal training session so to speak so there's there's not so much the the two-day recovery from from ours but again that's a that's more from a personal and and the academy manager that's the that the page we're kind of on i think that the, the first team are quite similar on that since the new managers come in as well yeah no that's spot on sorry to cut you off uh, i agree i think you could do you know you have it's important to have a day away and then you come back and it's just managing the intensity right so yeah, an active recovery, whether it's it's a walkthrough or it's still a session, or you just manage the the time and the rest that they have. You know, you can still train. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think it's important. I think, as you say, that that rest day is not only for the body, it's for the mind, and to work that mind back in a lighter, normal session, so to speak, on a Monday is quite quite beneficial. And then and then we go quite hard, Lewis. Then on a on a Tuesday, um, that's our day, our main physical day, Tuesday. So they'll do a double session. Uh, in terms of football, plus um, some some strength based or power based work as well within in the gym, so that's our main day really Tuesday. I have a quick cool question: When do you do oh, your functional trainings? What was that? Sorry. Uh, when do you do your functional trainings? Because I find that for me, what works best when I was coaching a U eighteen girls team, um, the day after the game, like after their rest day, that would be the day I do their functional for the next week because they women, they overthink. So they need kind of like this, you know, between four and five day gap of like thinking of what we're working on. Um, is it different with the boys? Yeah, I'd say almost the opposite with the boys. The boys um, can't keep the attention span for very long. So they're <laughs> the opposite. So I tend to do um, Thursday afternoon we'll do a tactical based, and then and then Friday before day before the game we'll do a refresher of, of sort of what we set set piece and, and tactics based, which again is a little bit lighter, um, but more um, just as I say, just a refresher, but more on the the psychological get them sort of you Would know. You say your sessions are based upon the opposition for the week coming. See a lot. Of, a lot of youth teams do that, to be honest. Uh, but I, I don't really. Um, no. Um, yes, yes, I want to win, but it's not the all the be all and end, end all uh, for my under 18s In my opinion, it, it's it's again going back to what I mentioned before. It's it's about that position position specific stuff. So, how am I going to perform on the Saturday? Now, again, what I said before is in terms of the learning happens on a Saturday. So. If I'm a, if I'm a right fullback, I'm going to come up against a different winger come every Saturday. Now I'd like those players to work that out for themselves. So if he's coming up against a quick winger or someone who's quicker than, quicker than him, how does he deal with that? How does he work that out? How quick does he work that out? Does he work that out in the first five minutes? Hopefully, um, how is he going to work? How is he going to deal with it? Does he need help? Does uh, does my defensive midfield player need to spot that in game and go and go and deal with it himself as well? I'd say so. So it's all about them trying to solve problems within the game without giving them all the answers, um, just guiding them along the way, really. But I think it's, um, yeah, I think 
I, I, I don't put too much stock in, in who we're playing against. Listen, if we're playing FA Youth Cup, we might have a little watch of who, who we're playing against because it's a little bit more important of a game. But uh, I know teams who, who analysts st- stringently look at the opposition coming in every week. And I don't think, in, not in my opinion, I don't think there's any need for it. I think the players need to be able to solve the problems themselves within game, which is the most difficult time to solve those problems. And that's how they add a game uh, better advantage. Tactically, certainly. Yeah, so your cycle is obviously development over winning mm. in that regards. Yeah. Oh, listen, if, if you watch us on a Saturday, you would think it'd be winning. But um, <laughs> but no, because we all want to win game day, don't we? That's 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 what it's all about. But um, but no, I th- it's we're we're never going to be sort of top of our division. So why put emphasis on that? It's all an emphasis on the development of the players and the better players within the group will hopefully rise. And uh, and do the best. And that's the way of working around it, really. You were saying that you kind of like to do like the guided the guided discovery methodology when it comes to your players on the game days. Um, do that also during your training sessions. Like, make have them you know really work on game decisions, like things that would happen in a game situation during the training. Yeah, I find it. It's very difficult to do in a training session, though, isn't it? It's um, it's trying to give them, it's trying to fit rules into what you're doing that aren't easy to work out, and trying make it difficult for them to succeed, but not too challenging, but in a way that they can try and work it out themselves, and you're not giving them all the answers. You can, as a coach, you can give them hints and you can give them little guidance along the way. But yeah, I, I, I'd like to try and do that. But it is it is quite difficult to do guided discovery within 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 the sessions, in terms of training session looking like game anyway, which is what we try and do. It's got to look like the game at the end of the day for us. But it is difficult. Do you ever um to, do you ever train like um, spontaneously in the sense like um, sometimes. I'll make a rule and I'll have one team play one man short in the middle of a training just because it's like in a game, if you get a yellow or a red card, you have to see how they react. Do you ever do this kind of game situation stuff? Absolutely. Overload, overloading the attack or overloading the defense, you know what yeah. I mean? So, Absolutely, yeah. yeah, absolutely. I think there's, there's loads of ways of doing it. I do, I do some sessions where I do, I'll do a scenario. This, I'll, I'll start the game as a scenario. So one team, um, here you are. I, I've done it before where I've said, listen, you're, you're Liverpool in the, in the Champions League final against Milan and you're 3-0 down. Um, you've got to come back within 10 minutes and the opposition have got to basically stop them coming back within the 10 minutes. And again, I'll structure that around, I'll put certain players in, in certain teams as to say, listen, this is, I might have the defending team be Milan, for example, um, with overloaded with defenders and, and the other team with attacking players with one less maybe. So they've really got to work around and they've really got to solve problems and find spaces. And yeah, yeah it, it's just trying to add little different things, isn't it? But yeah, that absolutely, yeah, definitely. Is that, Milan, yeah. Is, that, is that Milan with Inzaghi and Mirlo and uh, Maldini? Yeah, that, that unbelievable Milan team that had, <laughs> I think, Seydorf and Kaka and Crespo <laughs> Yeah, yeah they eventually, they're doing I'm, I'm not. I'm definitely not. I'm not a Milan fan. I'm not a Milan fan. My my team in Italy is Juventus, is Juve. My team in England. I've said this before, and uh, I got to watch because uh, I might get attacked here. But my team in England is uh, is Arsenal. Oh, Crystal. Uh, it's okay. I thought you were going to say Manchester United. So we're all right. We're all right. Crystal. Nah, United. I'm a United fan. Oh no. Nice, <laughs> million. There's, there's always one. There is always one. Uh, <laughs> hey, I, w- I wanted to say something, Neil, on what you said, and just that example with, uh, you know, given the, the players that situation uh, with the, like the Liverpool and you got to come back. I know you said, you know, creating decision-making in practice can be difficult, but I think that is a, a, a wicked example because just in that, you could see players are going to have to think, all right, well, we're down a goal. You know, they, they've overloaded their defense. And automatically, you're going to have to find a way to solve that problem that's in front of them, right? So it is decision making. And then within that, I was to think your about point, that, you Julian. Yeah. You find a lot about your players as well. So mm-hmm. some, yes. some will bend the rules. So mm-hmm. some will then, on the defending team, decide to boot the ball over the fence. So they're wasting a bit of time. 
Mm-hmm. Some will keep the ball in the corner even though it's training, and some will try and work their way out and, and make it compact. And, and so again, it's just, it, that's why that's where it becomes difficult because your session can break down if if you've got mm-hmm. your little rogue rebels who are trying to you know oh well you said we've got to we've got to be uh, we've got to stay on for this three 0 lead so we're just yeah. doing what you told us to. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah, that, your, that's the difficult part. But yeah, when you're doing your scenario based learning. Would you would you base that around a session? So let's say you said the Inter Milan, uh, so the AC Milan team had a three 0 lead. Would you say that their their challenge is to defend in a low block or, or to obviously ensure that they are narrow and compact and they, they keep that lead, or would you just leave it be free? Um, not a specific no. I think because again, if you're talking back to attacking and defensive principles, they're all very much the same. So if yeah. if you were to defend uh, a lead. You want to be narrow and compact. Yeah. If you are looking to attack and come back, you, you you're looking at maybe exploiting space and, and and rotation of movement and 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 trying to be clever. So I wouldn't I wouldn't specific because we we wouldn't set up as a as a low block or as a or anything like that in a game. But it's it's how those players again would solve that problem. For example, you might we might come up against a team who are playing a diamond. Now historically, our players have struggled against that, but again, have have had to adapt within game to deal with it. So again, if 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 that happens in training, then the players can maybe well, well this is what we can possibly do. How about you go mark him? He's causing causing us problems, and they and they kind of again trying to trying to get those sort of problem solving out out of them really. I think I think when I was at Newport and I was their analyst, we came up against Swansea. Or I think they played a, I think it was a box midfield four, and we struggled against that. Mm-hmm. So we just quite, didn't quite understand their rotation, and yeah, I think we got beaten five nothing. Mm. So yeah, so. That's it. if 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 uh, if formations are done really well and you've not come up against them before, it can be a, almost a shock to the system. You can almost yeah. see players, certainly young players, almost rabbits in headlights. Think what what is going on here. I mean, we're playing against the same formation every week. They've come up with something different. What do we do? And again, it's it's how it's how they deal with that in-game. You can help them at half-time and a little bit pitch side. But I like to think that they can maybe solve it themselves. And that's where you get your leaders from as well. You need more leaders on the pitch and that's, that's potentially how you can get. Well, I think it's a, it's a key thing as well. Also, as in terms of your sessions, uh, where where are you playing in from like are you playing in the attacking phase your attacking organization your your the your transition to the defense your defending or your defending order organization and then your transition to attack and then all those basically the four models are should be implemented in your session you know what i mean so uh definitely if you're and i i love the way you put the, in terms of the scenario because two things number one you get to find out who your players are um do they follow soccer do they know the the the, the passion behind, say, Liverpool fan base, AC Milan fan base, right? Right away, you start you start seeing uh, uh, you start seeing them engaged right away. They're like, okay, I got gotcha. you. I, I I see I see the the picture here now, right? So you're painting picture already for them, and you're getting it. Rather than if you if you didn't include that, and it it works for your team, right? Like for my girls' team, um, if I say Liverpool and AC Milan, I, I'm going to see crickets. You know, what I mean, I'm going to see deer cut <laughs> headlights, and and they'll be like. Okay, that doesn't mean anything to me, but I, I understand in that aspect. And that's one thing we try to we try to always do as well is as coaches is try to paint the picture for them. You know what I mean? Because once you've painted the picture and they see the scenario, they can um, they can reflect on it. They can work on it. You know what I mean? Rather than just throwing a whole bunch of this terminology out there and be like, I need this, I need this, and, uh, and then you, you've lost players. Players look at you, yeah, coach, yeah, coach, and then. You, you try and go and execute it and they're, they're, they don't do it, it's right? It's so. relative to them, isn't it? So yeah. a Liverpool-Milan sort of scenario that I've built there, when I've done it before, players have gone, right, I'm going to be caca. I'm going to be Cresco. Huge. So even at 16 to 18s, the playful side comes out and then and then obviously they're enjoying themselves and, and, and improve more and learn more when they're enjoying themselves, don't they? Whereas yeah, as well, you, you, you might do a little bit different with, with your team and, and make it more relative to, and more personal to those with, with a different scenario. Course. Well, once you once you reflect, say if you reflect on uh, on professional athletes, you tend to, as players, I believe, try to pick up their characteristic traits. You know what I mean? So, um, I've said this uh, even when I play with say uh, say with my daughter and my and my son in the back, and they follow soccer, and I'll be like, okay, I'm gonna be uh, I'm gonna be messy. Or my daughter's like, no, no, I'm gonna be messy. I'm like, okay, okay, fine, you be messy. So what does messy do? 
oh, Messi's going to do this. Oh, boom, boom. So they're going to they're going to pick up those character traits because they've seen it on TV, and they're yeah. going to basically uh, reflect it, mirror it onto the field or onto the the backyard and stuff like that. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this as a Messi. I'm going to do a watch this. I'm going to do a Ronaldo chop, and I'm going to continue my run and stuff like that. So I think it's huge. I think it's a very important factor to to, to do that, right? So. Uh, one thing we've done as well in our sessions when we do our video analysis and um, and we talk to our teams is basically getting it down to basics and reflecting in terms of who, like for the girls team, who are the, what's the national team? Who are the players? Do we follow them? Do you guys follow soccer? Like that, that's, those are the questions we start off. You know what I mean? Do you follow soccer? Yes, no, maybe. I, you need, I need to know as a coach in terms of what I'm dealing with here because if I start referencing stuff and you don't have that connection, then it's just irrelevant. It doesn't, it doesn't work, right? But if you have players, like I've had players in the past where they'll name you and be like, yeah, I, I watched uh, Canada play on a on a fee and it's go this and this and that. I'm like, okay, okay. I get you. I can reference to that. You know what I mean? But it, it's always challenging, especially here uh, in Canada, um, when you have a, a group of players or, or say that don't follow it. You know what I mean? They, they love it. There's nothing wrong with it. They, they love the soccer and they love, they love uh, the exercise and doing it. But I, I strongly believe if you want to pursue it and, and engulf in it, you have to know about it. You know what I mean? You, you got to really, you, you got to really follow it. You know, you got to know. I, I try and use are, who are these players? So, yeah, I try and use examples. So um, for my wide players, um, I'll pick someone from the Premier League. I'll say, listen, go and watch him. Yeah. Now, I won't make it unrealistic. It's, he's a completely different type of player. It'll be a very similar type of player to him. Yeah. Watch how the, he does the things you struggle with and watch how the, he does the things that he succeeds with. Um, and if they say, well, I, I don't watch him, make sure you watch him. It, it, it'd be massive for you. And then relate that to your own footage of, of when you play and how you can interact and, and, and use these situations to your own advantage. Even though Premier League's all the way up here and we're all the way down here, it can still be relative depending on who you're up against. And I think giving them examples is really good. I started one season of a new intake of um, doing a presentation and I put up in the presentation a player in world football of who I thought they were like um, and I think it's a good gauge for them as to know what type of player they are because sometimes they don't know so I think we had um, we had a big striker um, called Kyle and I, uh, I used Ada Rees who plays for um, Bill Bow was it? Yeah. He played for Bill Bow um, and uh, used him as, um, as an example of big target man, strong, decent agility, quite quick, but mostly target man, gets all the ball, gets in the box, scores goals. And if you can try and match up to what he does really, really well and bring it to your game, then it can be really beneficial to you as an individual. And I did it with all the players and, and they all had a bit of fun of, oh, no, I'm not him, or oh, yeah, yeah, you all have that, I'll take that. But it's uh, it engages them straight away. Again. It's real life. It's 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 professionals. It's star players, but also really really good for them to look at them and think, well, how can I bring a little bit more of what he does into my game? And I, I think it helps really well. Well, be, well, because you're identifying now the player, and it's not saying that you you, you got to play at the premier level. No, no one's saying that. What you're looking at doing is identifying uh, player player roles and profiles, right? So. If you're looking after a left back, you're looking at his, what is, what is this left back? How is he playing or is she playing? And look at the character traits. So what's, okay, take a look at your video and take a look at her video. Oh, but they're professional. I get that. We're not looking at the gameplay. We're not looking at the speed and the intensity of that. What we're looking at is how many times before getting the ball, do you see that player scanning the field? How many times do you see that player communicating? How many players, how many times do you see the body position? So these are things that you can mimic and actually continue doing session, you know what I mean, as a player. So if you can incorporate more scanning on the field, looking at those things, and if you can't do that, then it's, it's basically just say, you know what, I can't seem to see that. How can, I, how can you help me to, to work on those uh, aspects, right? And, and that's it. And it's always better, I think, in terms of pictures, videos, because me, uh, I think mentally and the way we absorb things, is, is a lot easier vision through our, through our what we see than sometimes is the terminology and, and, and communicate right? times. Um, it could be the person's voice that could turn you off and be like, okay, I'm not listening anymore. This guy's so monotone and stuff like that. And, and, and you, 
you've lost him or lost her on that. Whereas if you paint the picture and, and you show the video or reference to professional players on that, I think it's fantastic. And uh, I think coaches should, should reference to that. Touching base on that one, um, one of the things I was doing with my, my U10s, um, usually I know this, like I worked a lot with them, um, but once a week I would send videos to the parents to, to show the kids, um, to like kind of sit and just look at either positional things or it would be, it could be anything from like, for example, my, my philosophy was based around Barcelona's, so I would send them moments in games like small clippets of maybe under 30 seconds and the player had to identify you know three things that they saw offensively or defensively or transitionally and then when they would come to training we would have like an open discussion about it and that's how I would kick off usually most of my training sessions would be this week we're working on this based on what we saw on the video and then everyone had their moment to kind of like bounce off each other ideas of what they what they saw so they all had an idea they've all thought about it on their own they've explained it to each other now i'm able to like go into more focus and it's it's actually for i mean it's different coaching men versus women in my opinion but of the course, girls, yeah. they were so understanding at a young age of what we were working on and everyone was on the same page and um when I tried to transition that with my U18s, it was more difficult because they had already learned really bad habits. Back they've in the past, made, yep. They've already made their opinion of what player they are versus what player like fits in, in the team. And that's also something, you know, we can talk about like player profiling, like you were saying earlier, but like this all goes down to like the club. If the club doesn't have a set idea of the, the positional or the position of the player, it's really hard for a player to also come to a club and have success. If, for example, if they're like a Danny Alves, you know, they can like be a strong wing back, but we're playing with three defenders and they have to transition. Like, you know what I mean? Maybe it's better mm -hmm. for them to identify their strengths and go to another team or change position. Um, right. But it's, it's difficult because we don't really have that. We don't really have a strong base on any club in Ontario from what I've noticed. And I find there's a lot of players that are playing out of like position and it makes it difficult at the end of the day to like play the best players. That's where player profile is important for, for scouting, isn't it? Bringing in the right players to fit to your ethos. But if you haven't got an ethos in the first place, as you say, it's difficult, isn't it? It's chaotic. And I was, um, I think this one's trying to think maybe Five years ago, I was um, mentoring some other coaches at the provincial level. So I would just go and watch the provincial trainings. And eventually, I got to go on field with the coaches. And um, they were in like, the player profiling. Like, they were looking for players for their final team. And when I was talking to the coach, you know, I wanted to know his formation, his methodology, what he wanted from the players from each position. And, he, you know, it was really discouraging for me because I was told I'm just going to pick the best players. But what is considered the best players? You could pick exactly. the most technical mm -hmm. players, the most athletic players. At the end of the day, you could be picking 10 strikers. But if you, you know, if you don't have a balance on the field and you don't know what you, what formation you want, how can you really succeed? In my opinion, based on the players you choose just off of what you're seeing, yeah. No, like I find that really difficult because if there's no, um, let's just say like scouting rules for the club also, it makes it difficult for, for a coach to, to apply their methodology or their plan. No, a hundred percent on that. And then that's the thing. Um, you see, you see coaches and stuff like that and it depends on the level. And in, in Canada, I find, um, they're set, they're set in their ways. You know, if, if, if someone doesn't want to change, they're not changing. They're, they ain't changing, man. They're, 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 they're batting down. They're, they've built their roots and they're like, not just this Canada, is Christos, it's not just Canada. <laughs> a lot of places. I, I'm just, I'm just saying, I'm just saying, because for me, when, when I see it and I think we're doing good, I think we're moving forward. Like uh, uh, being part of the national youth program now, like for the, for my licensing that I'm going through, and dealing with Canada soccer, I like their methodology. 
um, uh, Stuart Neely, which is in Canada soccer, Jason DeVos. Um, fantastic. You know what I mean? I like it. But they need to transfer what they're, what they're looking at in Canada soccer and bring it down to Ontario soccer and across. Because I think Ontario soccer does follow it for sure, 100%. Um, but I think coaches don't see it sometimes. So I, I, when it comes down the pipeline, um, it gets lost in the paperwork. You know what I mean? It's like, oh, that's what they want me to do? Okay, throw it away. I'm out. And uh, I'm going to do this. But, but until you know, we get that, we're not going to – sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I was going to say, but, like, I mean, I've got my provincial B license, and one of the things that really bothered me was, like, the way they, they taught us. Like, we weren't able to make decisions. We were just taught – okay, here's your session, now coach the session, and that's, you, okay, you're able to coach it, great, you're, here's your certification, but, like, it's, a, like, a dummy, like, I don't have to have an opinion, I don't have to know how to create a session plan, I was given eight session plans, and I found that a little bit ridiculous, because the whole point of, you know, going to these um, licensing is to learn something, and to, for me, learning to learn is important as coaches. And exactly. I don't that enough. Mm -hmm. Now, yeah. now they do. Now they've they've changed it up now. So, uh, just to add on that, back like when they used to give you session plans, now you're creating session plans, and they they, they give you a template. You put in your session plan. You can do whatever you want. You can put stick man A, stick man B, pass the ball between each other, and then hand that in. You if you think they'll they'll turn around, they'll be like, okay, so uh, A, w what's your topic? What's your theme? So they really work with you. So they've changed that. And I like that because um, one of the things that we did for uh, just recently for the national youth license, a pre-task was uh, a system, uh, system sorry, uh, a team analysis right off the bat. So give me a, your best team analysis in, in the four in the four moments in the game and the five moments in the game because they they add set pieces, right? So set pieces we always need to work on, <laughs> especially corners. But uh, so the set pieces, and then uh, again starting from your different your different stages. So attacking organization, transition to defend, defensing organization, transition to attack. And, and then what they've asked is basically on a player base as a coach, what's the strengths and weaknesses you believe? Um, and then we, we did like a color coordination. So green being great, yellow being needs some work, and red, yeah, we need some, that definitely need some work on that. So it's good because do I know it's right or wrong? This is what I feel. So I submit that, and then you get a, It's not evaluated, but it's like, okay, I see where this coach's mentality is and methodology I see where coach number two's uh, methodology and mentality is. So what they, what they do is what I believe is going to happen. I'm, I'm, we haven't got there yet, but I believe uh, they're going to get everybody and be like, okay, this is what we have in terms of coaches in the, in the room. So this is what we would like you to do in terms of, say, Canada National Youth. Because they've changed it around. Allison ever since, right? They, back in the day, it was the, um, the pre-B. Yeah, that's completely vanished. And they had the C license. Um, your B now, I have my national B, which is the provincial, but it's the national B part one. And they have uh, national B part two. They Apparently, they're going to be scrapping that again. And they're going to go to just national B. Um, they implement, uh, they brought in the uh, So Canada's going through a lot of changes, a lot of transitioning. Yes, it costs a lot of money. Uh, but I'm part of it. Uh, I want I want to develop as a coach as best as I can, and I personally, from my own opinion, I think that what I'm doing now and for for here is do the best I can here, and then once I've gotten as much, I guess my credentials and, and keep pushing, I'll be exploring elsewhere, right? Uh, eventually, so I'm going to look for my UF and stuff like that. But um, I feel like I'm focusing on here right now. Get it down packed. I'm in Canada. I live in Canada. Get their methodology down packed from all licensing aspects. And then as soon as I get that going, okay, I got this, let's transition out to the UFA now and, and start with, uh, I think it's your international C, I think is it? I, I could be wrong. And then go from there, so. Yeah, it's it's changed, it keeps changing. Um, what, there's two options. Either you go, oh my God, these guys are crazy and it's money hungry and I quit. Or you gotta try and um, ride the tide, you know what I mean? And, See what happens. <laughs> yeah, I think you gotta take it with a take it with a grain of salt, right? Because if it wasn't changing, then we'd have a problem. Um, but with just, just like any yep. certification, um, some instructors are gonna be good, and you're gonna walk away with maybe three good things. And some instructors are gonna be absolutely terrible, and you're gonna walk away knowing exactly what coach you don't want to be. You know what I mean? So it's just. Yeah. 
yeah, there's either way you learn something, right? And you, and you take something away from it. Um, but that, that's my thing. I've, I've done a couple of uh, coaching um, badges in the States myself, and I've had some absolutely terrible instructors who are DOCs of their respective clubs. And you just wonder like, oh my God, you're teaching 160 kids, right? Mm-hmm. And like, you're just ruining them. And then I've had some that were amazing and they said barely anything. And I walked away with stuff that I've applied over my coaching career, like thus far. So, you know, it's a spectrum. Yeah. I have uh, have a a little bit of a topic change Um, uh, is regarding COVID, of course. So what happened here, I'll give you guys a little insight for Canada. They had, at at one point, they sent out a memo and they're saying, okay, so we can go back. They're going to lift up the suspension. And we're going to be able to play with uh, a total of five players. So four players and a coach. So I was already eager on that. I, I messaged my technical director and I was like, okay, yeah, great. Just uh, let me know when the practice times are. Within, I don't know, two minutes, they sent out a mail back saying, uh, sorry, guys, that's the wrong information. Uh, we're not going to be lifting up uh, suspensions uh, or any sanctions. So things are still as, as normal. Sounds the like problem, the minister. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the problem the problem i think is is when we do go forward and we finally lift up all sanctions and and, and this i i feel i could be wrong this is my opinion i feel that the the game of soccer is going to change man it's going to change um from our level i'm not talking at the professional level right now but all these new restrictions and stuff like that in terms of when they said to go back to practicing Kids are going to have to be in a six by six, six feet by six feet quadrant. Um, so great for the attacking phase in terms of space and, and shape and, and position uh, profile, which is good. But on the offensive side of things, if you can't get into the other person's square, how are we going to develop that? How are we going to – not develop it, sorry. They've been developing all along. But how are we going to implement that? Because when we want to get back to games and stuff like that and, and, and play teams – like, this is what I'm worried about. I'm worried about, like, guys, like, I know this is dangerous and that's scary, but if you lift up on sanctions, I don't know. I don't know, what, I don't know what to think. So do you guys have any opinion on that or advice? I, I think it's a, there's a lot of moving parts, right? So from, from training within that and having those restrictions as far as space goes, I'm pretty sure they're going to have to lift the restrictions on training to the point that builds up to where we're allowed to play in the game. Because you can't train five kids twice a week and then jump into an eleven inside game on Saturday, right? So it's it's so it's it's weird, Crystals. Like I I really can't wrap my mind around how they're gonna roll it out. Um, but it'll be interesting. And the only thing that comforts me is that nobody knows how the hell they're gonna go about it. So you're not wrong. Nobody. But you're trying. Nobody knows. Yeah. I think that's it. I think. It's not just it's not just football. It's it's the whole world, isn't it? The landscape yeah. has changed completely with everything we do. So it's so hard to predict how we are going to coach our players in different ways. And from from my point of view, I think you'll get a massive uh, if it does get a, a slow introduction to to full time training. I would imagine from your point of view, Julian, it'd be it'd be better from a strength and conditioning point of view because you can do so much without just working with the, with the whole group, can you? Or, or with them separated two metres apart or whatever that, for you, it's fantastic. <laughs> yeah, for sure. I, I, think, I, think it, I think it's great for just all coaches. I think from a, from a personal level, you're going to get to have so much more one-on time with players, one-on-one time with players, which I think a lot of players value as well, where you, you know, you'll get maybe an hour to spend with four players and, and maybe, you know, work on things that they need individually. Whereas, Normally in the week, you got to work with a group of 16 and it's, it's all really team-based, right? So they don't get that one-on-one. So I think, I think it's going to be very good for, for coaches and players um, until we build up to getting back to, to full steam. But yeah, for SNC, I love it. <laughs> I finally get to work one-on-one with kids. It's great. Scary stuff. You know, it's scary, and I just uh, I've been trying to wrap my brain around it for for days, weeks, right now, and uh, I don't know. It's just they keep lifting. We have lift up sanctions here in Canada in terms of uh, businesses opening, curbside pickups, and stuff like that. But uh, the sport industry, like, I'm pretty sure they're gonna have to lift up those restrictions to play the game. Like, you're gonna have to. The game is the game. You can't change the 
Yeah. You can't change the, the, the game flow on that, right? Because uh, I know that By Bayern is playing right now and it's full opposition. They're getting 22 players playing at once. Okay, nobody in the stadium. But again, that's a professional level that generates hundreds of millions of dollars. Versus, I find it all very bizarre, though, that you've got 11, 11 v 11 on the football pitch with no masks on. Then you've got the coaches with the masks on. And then you've got substitutes sitting two metres apart. It's all a bit mixed messagey, yeah. isn't it? It's all it's a bit bizarre, bizarre, though, isn't it? It's all yeah. to show that you know they're doing it in this instance. But... Yeah. yeah, yeah. It is, all, it is. All, it, all it takes is a couple of players getting sick and they're going to shut that right down, right? So... Well, I, was watching, uh, I was watching Gary Neville and, and Jamie Carragher talking about the Premier League and what they might do. Um, and they're of the opinion that what they should do is quarantine all players two weeks prior to full return. Um, and then I think they've got sort of nine, nine games left and some have got ten. So that Gary, Gary Neville was sort of advocating the idea of, yeah, you have them two weeks quarantine beforehand. You then have them play all their games within that five to six week period, all the nine, ten games. Still, all, all whilst in in quarantine, um, so that all players have been tested going into quarantine. There's no problems going in, so no uh, risk of infection of anyone. They get the games done, season finished. Um, so how, whether they'll do that or not, I don't know. But it's certainly it, the way they've done the testing over here now, um, and the return to play and the return to training, probably the safest place to be. Uh, in Britain right now is on a, on, a, on a professional Premier League training pitch because you can't get on there if you're tested and, and, you're, and you're negative. So they're all, they're all confirmed uh, negative uh, testing. So I don't know. It's, it, it's all, very, all very odd and bizarre, isn't it? I can't see us getting back to um, full watch spectator sport until well into next year, I don't think. But again... And, that, and, that, and that's hard because if you look at history... Okay, and you look at history with sports, that's sports is one of the biggest connecting factors for people. You know what I mean? So hockey, soccer, basketball, football uh, in the States, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Julian, but uh, college football, college, uh, uh, anything college related is massive. They all look forward to that. You know what I mean? It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's their outing, right? It's, it's how you unite and bring people together, the passion behind it. So can you imagine the mental aspect of what, how it's going to affect us uh, or you know, the younger athletes going forward? How are they going to, how are they going to perceive what soccer looks like? Well, They're going to look back at YouTube. It's how you release all your, your, your energy and your, 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 your pent up frustrations and some yeah. release it in a positive way, some release it in a negative way, but that's how you release it with sports. Generally, that's, again, Lewis, Lewis will tell you that's, that's Britain over here as well is, is football, football, football. So I don't think, I think 5% of our population have watched Bundesliga before last week. And then I think 95% <laughs> watched it last week because football. Was so, um, uh, yeah. how, how is it in Spain for you, Alison? What, what's the restrictions at the moment for you? Is it quite strict or? Um, it's honestly been incredibly confusing because they opened the beach last week. So you can do sport on the beach. You can swim, you can run, you can, do things in partners like I can go and play foot volley in a, with my boyfriend and but you can't do it with three people there's an issue with three people <laughs> and then um, now it's mandatory if you're not doing sport you have to wear a mask or you'll get charged 600 euros wow wow interesting because I can be running in the street breathing on people but if I'm just casually walking I have to wear a mask Wow. Um, so wait, you're in Spain? Yeah, Barcelona. Okay, I heard La Liga just got the, the green light to open. Yeah, yeah. June 8th. Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. I mean, Barcelona's been training for a while. I think two, two weeks now they've been training together. Mm -hmm. But it's been more like small-sided or individual training. Like they're doing more of those like like Instagram stuff, you know, like trying to kick a ball in a basketball hoop, like funny mm -hmm. things. Mm -hmm. social media stuff um i don't think they've done a lot of team team based training um so i don't know i think monday are it's going to change though i think we're allowed to be uh, we're actually allowed to have 10 people come over to our house really <laughs> I, I don't understand Why 10? 
<laughs> you're allowed to have 10 people enter your house, but you can't play like a small sided game on the beach with three people. Oh my goodness. I don't, how they're gonna, I don't know how they're gonna monitor this. It's been really bad so far. Like wow. everyone's confused with the rules. Like I'm only allowed to go outside between 6 a.m. and 10 a.m. and then between 8 p.m. and 11 p.m. But today I walked for an hour at like 4 p.m. and no one said anything. And I was like, okay, well. <laughs> everyone's just kind of pushing the limits to see what they can or can't do. So. It's but even even, even the masks, the, the information about the masks that I was aware of was that it's only really people who've got COVID-19 that should be wearing a mask to stop the spread. And mm -hmm. anyone who doesn't have the mask, it won't make any difference. In fact, it, it could make it worse because worse. Yeah. Of the, um, the moisture that, yeah. that you mm -hmm. wrap the mask will, will absorb more uh, bacteria. So, who knows? Yeah. 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 Well, we've we've got it here, haven't we, Neil? In the UK, where you can you can go to work and work with your work colleague uh, throughout the day, obviously with social distancing, but you're not allowed to visit any family members still. So you're allowed to go and work with somebody in work, but you can't see your family. Well, even even the more bizarre thing in Britain. So uh, Boris Johnson's in charge of, of of the United Kingdom, as you well know, um, but each individual country has kind of got their own thing. So Wales are on complete lockdown where Lewis is. Um, yeah, so we're, can't go we're still in the yeah, but, but in England you can but yeah. if you to cross over the border into Wales which is essentially still the United Kingdom governed by Boris Johnson with the same rules then you're not allowed to sit on the beach you'll get fined yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, well guys you know what thank you very much uh, it was a great talk again uh, we do this weekly um, I'll send out uh, invites again for next week's uh, soccer talk uh, it's great to have uh to, to 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 talk to you guys and really get these topics uh out in the open and, and talk with other people rather than uh people that are in my house because <laughs> it only goes so far with soccer so uh, but thank you very much and uh julian thanks again for coming buddy i really yeah. appreciate it uh allison thank you neil lewis and chris thank you guys uh, enjoy the rest of uh, your weekend, and uh, definitely we'll uh, we'll catch up again next week. Uh, I have another guest coming out next week, and uh, yeah, let's uh, let's keep doing this. Um, I I love it, and uh, I think it's good. It's a good time to sit down on a Saturday, um, talk to people across uh, across the, the the seas there, and uh, in Spain and England, and uh, love it. So guys, stay safe there, and hopefully by next week. We can have 20 people in our house, and then the week after that, it's we'll see how it goes. Okay, so uh, take care, take care on my end, and um, we'll see you all next week. Nice yeah, meeting. yeah, man. Nice yeah. meeting everybody. Stay safe and watch the Bayern game. It's about to start. All right, guys. Take care. Yeah. All right. See you next week. Bye, bye.